Why was Jesus warning about the leavening of the Pharisees? That's what we're going to find out today in Luke 22. Luke has 24 chapters in it. That means after today, two more left. And then on next Friday, we'll start John. I like this idea of going through the Gospels for the different purposes and the different reading. I'm excited to start looking at Acts and the early church and moving on towards it. But John's going to be exciting because he's kind of a trippy guy, and we'll talk about him later. So now there's a plot out there to kill Jesus, the chief priests and the scribes. Jesus is making them look bad. Right at Passover, when there's so many people in the city, but they're afraid of all the people that are in the city because so many people follow Jesus or at least are listening to him. Some of them are even Pharisees themselves. They've just had it with him. And we've seen this in other gospels. And now it is the feast of the unleavened bread, which is something that was instituted at the time of Moses to carry on and talk about Passover, where the angel of death passed over the children of Israel and took out the Egyptians. It says that Satan entered Judas called Iscariot. He was one of the 12. He went and talked to the chief priests about how he could betray Jesus. And they were happy. So they gave him money. And he said, sure, I'll do that. And so he looked for an opportunity, it says, to betray him in the absence of the crowd. Again, they were afraid of the crowd. So he's like, you know what? I can figure out a good time where he's not around a crowd. I know a schedule. And you can arrest him in a more quiet way. But we talked about all the different reasons and why Judas betrayed Jesus. And I think we have it right here. Satan entered Judas. And that, in the end, is what got him. You have to be careful about giving Satan that opportunity to take advantage of those moments. I'm sure Judas had many thoughts. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And we know from the Gospel of Matthew that this whole planning and plotting to kill Jesus happened at Caiaphas's house. He was the high priest. So the big dog here in the temple structure. We have Passover with the disciples. It's interesting because when I was starting to read a little bit more about Passover, when I did the first gospel, which was Matthew, people were saying, ah, oh, well, we don't think that Passover existed at the time of Jesus. It came out hundreds of years later. But when you read Exodus, God tells them to mark the day and to celebrate God's redemption from slavery from Egypt. And now we're paralleling God saving people in redemption from sin instead of the Egyptians. But of course, Passover was celebrated at this point. I'm not going to tell you that they had every tradition exactly the same, but I bet you, knowing how tradition is so important in the Jewish faith, pretty, pretty darn close. So he says, go prepare the Passover for us. Jesus says, there's going to be a guy carrying a jar. Rumor is that that was Mark. And follow him to the house and say that my master wants your guest room so we can have Passover together with my disciples. So maybe more than just the apostles, but we know at least the apostles. Showed him to the upper room. They prepared Passover meal. He then reclined at the table because free people at Passover recline at tables. And he says that he wanted to eat this Passover with him before he suffers. Because we'll not eat it until the fulfilled kingdom of God. He said before that we're not going to drink the fourth cup of gratitude. He's also not going to eat either. And that's when he instituted communion, where he takes the bread, divides it among the people. He takes the cup of wine and divides it and lets them drink of it. Says he's not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until his kingdom has come. Takes the bread broke it, gave thanks. Reminds me of when Jesus created the food for the thousands of people that he raised it to heaven and prayed over it. So I have the forecasting of how we pray over food to God, but also now with this communion. We do it today in our own communion services. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he says, this is the cup poured out for you. The new covenant in my blood. Someday we'll do a podcast about all the covenants, but this is a new covenant. He has communion with him, but then he says, the hand of him who betrays me 
is with me at the table. As it's been determined, this has been part of the plan. But woe to that man whom he is betrayed. So then there are, it says they all started questioning each other. Who's going to do this? Makes me wonder too, were they worried it was going to be them? Because there were other passages in other gospels. Is it, is it I, Lord? Am I the person who's going to do it? Maybe a lot of them were thinking about it, not just Judas. Oh boy, because we see Peter crack at that time when he goes and denies Jesus. Maybe they were starting to have doubt among everybody. We thought we were going to come into Jerusalem and take names. We are coming in as conquerors sent by God. And now Jesus is just dedicated to dying here. Probably caused a lot of doubt among a lot of people. That whole dispute, which is just so ridiculous, who's the greatest? And Jesus is like, that's what Gentiles do. That's they care about who's on top and who has the best position and who's seated in the best place. But instead, the greatest of you must become the youngest. Remember, the child is the most important one. As Jesus said before, the one who is greater is the one who serves, not the one who reclines at the table. And he says, I'm the one among you who serves. He's the greatest servant of all, and they should do likewise. That's how you become great. He says, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign you as my father assigned me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes. We had the answer. We said it before. 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 11 apostles, but they're going to sit on thrones judging and they're going to be brought into this whole kingdom as judges that are going to be there. Isn't that amazing? Jesus then says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. He's going to shake you up, but I have prayed that you would have faith that you may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen brothers. And and Peter, again, like I said, it's easy when you're talking about theoretical things. I'm ready to go to prison to death. And Jesus says, tell you, Peter, now he switched from Simon to Peter. The rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. It's not even asking the big questions like, are you a follower? Some harder questions. Are you plotting with Jesus to have a new kingdom of heaven? Instead, you're just not even going to say you even know me. Peter talks a good game. He's a bold guy and he thinks of his strength, I think, very highly. And and Jesus is saying it's not going to be there. But I think that's the point is in all these times, we have to constantly be relying on God putting our faith and our trust and our strength in God instead of thinking, I'm a tough guy. I can take it. This is never going to happen. It's the same thing that happened in the boat and walking on water. First, he had his eyes on Jesus, and then he looked around and saw the waves, and suddenly he lost faith in himself that he could walk on water. Peter is going to change, and we're going to find out when we get to other books of the Bible how he does. But then he says, When I sent you out with nothing, you didn't have bags of money or sandals or anything. Did you lack anything? And they're like, no, we had everything we needed. And he says, now let the one who has the money bag take it. Likewise, the knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, the scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he is numbered with the transgressors, the people who are plotting against Jesus. For it is written about me. For what is written about me has its fulfillment that he would be betrayed. And they said, Well, what do you mean? Here's two swords. Said to them, It's enough. It means be done with this. They don't understand what he is saying at all. But it says, Let the one who has the money bag take it. We're talking about Judas. He got paid by the high priest to betray Jesus. So Jesus is now going to pray on Mount of Olives. Again, that's across the valley on the other side. He asked them to come with him. Come and pray with me. Pray that you may not 
enter temptation. He goes a short distance, a, a stone's throw away, and prays, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's a hard thing for us to consider because we often ask God for our will to be done. And Jesus is saying, no, your will be done. And then appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthened him. And in agony, he prayed even more earnestly, it says, sweat was coming from him in like drops of blood. Someone who was a doctor said that when you are so stressed out and you are now sweating blood, that is a sign of great stress. And Luke being a doctor is the one who mentions it because he probably recognized this is not a good thing. So he rose, came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not enter temptation. He's not asking them to pray for him. He's not asking them to pray for this whole thing to just disappear. Instead, he is asking them to pray for themselves and their strength against temptation. Judas already failed, but don't you too. So while he was speaking, there was a crowd and Judas, who was one of the apostles, comes near and kisses him. And Jesus is like, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? I mean, and we know in other gospels, he says rabbi, and that I at the end means my, my rabbi, my teacher, not just a random teacher, my teacher. This is just the ultimate, but it's betrayal is not even corporate, like where you would say, okay, all right, he's right over there, go get him. Instead, Judas leads the betrayal with a term of endearment and a kiss. And so then they said, hey, should we strike with our swords? Because we just got done talking about the swords. We have swords. And it says one of them, we're going to find out in John who that was. Spoiler alert, it was Peter. And he cuts off the ear of the servant. That means that when Peter swung the sword, he was going for a headshot. This wasn't, I'm going to smack you with the sword and try to make you stagger backwards or something. He was going for the head. Missed, cut off the ear. Jesus says, no more of this. And he touches the man and heals him. Again, we said in the last gospel that Jesus wasn't only just saving this poor servant who was just there probably, but he was also saving Peter because Peter would have been hounded for the rest of his life for attacking a man and probably put to death for it. This was saving two men. So, Then the chief priests and the officers and the elders came out against him. And he says, did you come out with swords and clubs like I was a robber? Am am I some kind of threat to you? Am I some kind of a criminal? I was with you day and day in the temple. He didn't even do anything. And Jesus knows why, because they were scared of the crowds. But now in the middle of the night, with the power of darkness, you come out here and do this? Yeah, you're a bunch of chickens because you came out here in the dark because you're too afraid of the people to do this in the open, in the daylight. So then it says that they, were, they took Jesus away. They brought him to Caiaphas's house, the chief priest, the high priest, and Peter was following at a distance. I think knowing Peter or the way we sort of feel like we do, he's probably looking for an opportunity to bust Jesus out or see where he's being taken. So they come up with a plan. Jesus, Peter's always about the plan and coming up with something. And so he's sort of like, mm-hmm, I'm just warming my hands by the fire in this courthouse. And again, we see a girl says, hey, you're one of them, aren't you? And he says, no, nah, woman, I don't know who you, he is. And a little time later, someone else saw him. Hey, aren't you one of them? And Peter's like, nah, not me. I'm not that guy. And then at the very last time, Another person insisted and said, surely this is one of them. I mean, listen to his accent. He talks like a Galilean. We've heard more in other Gospels. And in the case, it was the young girl accusing Peter of this. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the rooster crowed. Morning is here. Peter's realizing that he just betrayed Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. And he wept bitterly. He knew he did the very thing he said he wouldn't do. Again, I think it's easy to say when it's theoretical 
you sort of get, like I said, the idea that Peter is trying to keep his tabs on what is happening with Jesus and he's in the courtyard of Caiaphas's house. Probably justified it that I'm trying to watch what's going on here. I'm trying to figure out what we can do. Instead, he, he betrayed Jesus too. We had Judas betray Jesus in a very direct way. Now, Peter did too by denying he even knew him. We're going to find out more about what happens after that in John. So we're going to get more of that story. But Peter knew it. He knew that he let the Savior down. Jesus is mocked. Again, they hit Jesus and said that very snarky thing. Oh, we'll prophesy about who just hit you. You know, very awful things that are being said. And so now Jesus goes before the council. This is going to be the elders and everybody else. And if you're the Christ, tell us, say it, just let us know. We, We got more of the story again in other gospels about how they prepared for this. And he said, if I tell you this, you're not going to believe it. And if I ask you, you're not going to answer anything I say, because every time I ask you, you don't say anything. From now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the hand of the power of God. Are you saying you're the Son of God? You say that I am. And so now they said, well, we don't even have to make any more stuff up because he just said it from his own lips. He's blaspheming. He knows they're not listening. They're not asking him questions. But I thought this was kind of interesting because, again, he uses that word, you say that I am. And again, that I am is going to be that code word of Yahweh, I am. It's the name that God gave to Moses, I am who I am. And so when he says that, it is that code language that has a special relationship to God, its own name. So they know it. He knows it, and that is one of the many times where Jesus uses the I am. It's kind of funny. There's a whole Bible study out there about how many times Jesus says, I am. I am the light of the earth. I am this and that. One of the times is they ask him if he is Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am, and now he's saying it again. I am. You say that I am. He said it. This also parallels what we heard in Mark 14, 61 through 62. And that ends Luke 22. What I'm going to meditate on is this idea of trusting ourselves, how Peter insisted he's not going to deny Jesus, and yet he did. How many times do we feel like we can rely on our own power? I always think about that too. Like if it ever came down to brass tacks, deny Jesus. I'm never going to deny Jesus. It's not going to happen. Easy again for us to say no. I'm going to think a little bit about that. And what I'm going to pray about is that strength to keep praying. So where Jesus says that we should not enter in temptation. All the things that we see that happen at the end of Jesus' life, the horrible things. I mean, I watched The Last Temptation of Christ. This is one of the most moving things I saw. You have to realize that Jesus said, this is all happening because the kingdom has to be fulfilled. Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed. Like I said, if you looked at Jesus' time schedule, it would say, okay, well, the woman's going to teach me to be healed. In this case, he's like, I'm going to pray. I'm going to yell at the dudes for not staying awake. And the angel's going to come and strengthen me. And I'm going to pray some more. And then Judas will show up. He knows what's going to happen. And this is happening with his permission. He knows that Peter is going to deny him, and he tells him that. But you have to understand that even though he wants this cup to be removed from him, nobody wants to be tortured. No one wants to die in crucifixion, even Jesus. But he knows it must happen. It is God's will that it happens. And if it doesn't happen, the entire redemption of mankind doesn't happen. So he is ready to stand up to it and know that this is going to happen. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please pray for me. This is tough stuff and I will pray for you. I'm hoping that we're all learning something about the scripture as we go through it with a bit of a smaller step so that we can learn, I guess, each part of it. And I would love to hear from you, your opinion of how this is going. You can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. 
love to hear from you. And have a great weekend.